Hello <laughs> and uh, welcome to Christmas Crumbs Under the Table. This is week three um, of Advent. I'm Christian Forster. Um, as you'll see, yesterday was the first cracker of Christmas. Um, so I'm out here walking with my dogs, Banjo and Luna, and we'll go this way. <laughs> um, and uh, this morning, we're, as I said, we're looking at Luke's Gospel. Uh, we're going to look at it from two angles. One's the historicity of the census and the other is the meaning of the shepherds. So I always remember I started teaching uh, on the events of Christmas some years back now and um, it was almost as soon as I started people used to come up to me and say have you seen that episode of QI? <laughs> I mean they're referring to one where Stephen Fry um, has a question around Christmas and the events in Luke's Gospel and then finishes by saying of course you know Luke lied, made it all up, none of it's true, no history behind any of it <laughs> and, and of course <laughs> That goes out as the kind of the gospel according to St. Fry, um, and people get worried about it. Um, unfortunately, um, Stephen Fry was just exhibiting his own prejudices. Um, he was reciting kind of facts from about 150 years ago. <laughs> uh, so in the 1850s, I think it was, that German theologian Johann Strauss had first made this claim about Luke. Um, and the truth is today, if you buy any modern serious commentary, <laughs> They may not all 100% think that Luke got everything correct, because they're not always written by believers, <laughs> um, but they all take seriously the things he writes about. So he, he writes about a census, that was one of the things. Oh, there's no evidence of a census. <laughs> well, actually, there's masses of evidence of a census. It's just not the one we kind of thought it was. Um, there's actually a, an early church historian by the name of uh, Paul Orosius, I think it was, um, who kind of traveled between Rome and Jerusalem a lot. Um, so writing in the 4th century, pushing into the beginning of the 5th, he, he kind of dropped, casually drops the fact that, of course, Luke's census wasn't... Um, uh, Luke's census was the, the very first registration that the empire insisted on, um, on people's taking to the, to the emperor. And, and that little phrase suddenly gives Luke's census a, a new um, kind of um, perspective. Um, so it's not actually about taxation, and that was one of the criticisms about taxation, you see. It said, why would the Romans make a, a vassal state to Jerusalem, collect their tax for them directly? They wouldn't, you see. They, they collect their own tax, but they have to pay tribute to, to Rome. That was the thing. You know, why would they do that? Well, actually, because this wasn't to do with taxation. It was, it was a registration. It's the word that, that um, Luke uses. And although that, that word is, is used most commonly for censuses for taxation, <laughs> It's also the word that is used when the Romans forced people to register and swear an oath of allegiance to the empire and to the emperor. And, and so what we're being told is that Luke's census is actually that first registration. Well, now we know that, suddenly Josephus writes about it. And Josephus, the famous Jewish historian who wrote so much, <laughs> tells us in the last years of Herod's life, um, he's involved in a registration where people have to swear allegiance to the emperor. Now Tacitus actually tells us um, that in generations after Augustus there's a, an occasion where the Senate gets out the documents that um, Caesar Augustus actually wrote some of them which he recorded in his own hands and which recorded the numbers and strength of every nation within his empire. See it's a reference to the same thing. And Josephus tells us in the processing of that census um, Herod had included um, an allegiance to him. Uh, that, that's not particularly surprising. Um, if you think about it in the way the ancient world worked, this decree goes out, we want to get everybody to swear allegiance to the emperor. Um, and, um, and we actually have the records of this process being done about 3 um, BC in a region not that far from Jerusalem. They, the, the whole registration would have taken several years to administer. So that small discrepancy of three um, which is after Herod, of course, um, would, is not really a big problem. And actually, we actually have a, a copy of, the, of what they're forced to swear, which it allows space within it for regional variation. So what it seems that Josephus is telling us is at the point where the emperor is forcing everybody to swear allegiance to him, he, Herod has included a clause and to him as well. <laughs> so anyway, the, the census kind of goes out, and that's in the final years. Interestingly, we know that in the kind of the interfamily kind of fighting of Herod's family in the last years of his life, there's also some jokes being made about how two of his sons are really only fit to become village scribes because they can read, so at least that's something useful they can do. Now, why is that significant? Well, that would be significant because it's actually kind of the village scribes or, or, or local kind of priestly castes in all of the various nations who are 
on the whole, you're administering this process. So um, perhaps it's a reference <laughs> to the fact that there's recruiting going on at the moment for village scribes to, to process the whole thing. Um, so Luke is suddenly looking a lot more historical. There's some other criticism, of course, in the thing. They say, well, why did Mary go with him? Well, Mary goes with Joseph, not because she has to, um, but because actually it's a convenient way for them, seeing as people know that they have not yet consummated their marriage and yet she's becoming pregnant if he carries her off to, um, to another town <laughs> um, where people don't know all of the full history and they just she's a young girl who turns up who's at the early stages of the pregnancy when they get there, say, or, or middle terms. So he's probably just being protective. Um, and then, then you add to it another criticism. She said, well, there's no evidence of people being told to go to their hometown for any Roman kind of tax collecting or censuses. And, and that's probably true. Um, but given the context as we're looking at it, um, if, if Herod has added this inclusion of an allegiance to him, and he's highly insecure at this stage. Um, he's, he's actually just recently executed two of his sons because um, he's suspicious of them. It's highly, highly suspicious. <laughs> he may well have required the family of David. So it may not be everybody has to go to their hometown, but actually if you're part of the royal descent or significant families, maybe he's forced them to go. It's just a possibility, just throwing those things out. Um, <clears throat> so for whatever reasons, <laughs> if you look at Luke's census, um, which is clearly put into the gospel to, to anchor um, his account of the story of Jesus in real history, and um, suddenly, with, in the light of modern research and things that have been dug up, we, we suddenly know there is a major registration that goes on, instigated by Augustus, for the whole of the empire to be registered and in the process to swear an allegiance um, to the emperor. And then there's a, another little kind of interesting kind of uh, marker in the mix. <laughs> um, because it turns out that the Pharisees didn't like this. Uh, and so the Pharisees, 6,000 of them, didn't sign the census. Um, and actually, um, if we kind of piece together the history, I've got a lot more on this if this is of interest to you and, um, in one of the series I've done on the kind of Christmas um, narratives um, a few years back, so you can always look at those if, if you want to know more. But um, uh, at about the time that, that uh, Herod is finding out that the 6,000 Pharisees have not signed the registration, which is likely to get him in trouble with Rome, he needs to get better than that. <laughs> Um, he therefore finds them, finds them a huge amount of money. And his sister-in-law, because she's supportive of the Pharisees and a patron of the Pharisees, just pays it for them. But he doesn't know that she's paid it for him initially. Uh, later he's going to find out, and this is going to make him very suspicious, and the, the Pharisees are going to start prophesying that actually Herod's going to be replaced and probably it will come through his sister-in-law's line, <laughs> um, which is going to make him even more insecure. And that's about the period, um, as he's finding all of these things out, that the Magi turn up, um, because a king's been born, and that would have totally freaked him out, of course. <laughs> but that's uh, that's Magi. That the Magi story is Matthew's rather than Luke's. But you see how they fit together. Um, so, so Luke has actually given us something that does very nicely anchor us into history. And, and actually, uh, while we won't do it this morning, it fits surprisingly well with what Matthew tells us too. Um, so anyway, let's think about the second part of Luke's story because people like the story of the shepherds as well. Um, and that's one of the kind of key components that he gives us. So, um, after that kind of very rushed um, description of, uh, of, Mar of, of Luke's kind of historicity, and um, putting his story very firmly into the context of, of actually concrete history that we can actually dig up. I haven't touched on all of those things, but some of that is tablets and stones we've dug up since uh, in the last kind of century or so. Um, so we can really say that Luke is, um, as is so often the way, an accurate historical record. But then he gives us something that has more theological significance. Um, so many of us will be aware of the fact that uh, the, the verse that's quoted um, in Mark, Matthew's Gospel to the Magi about going to Bethlehem actually comes from Micah. And uh, Micah 5 you Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you're least among the clans of Judah, etc. Um, uh, but very often we just don't bother to kind of look at the context a little bit wider. Um, and it may not be evident and obvious to us as modern readers, but if you, if you do stretch your context back a few verses um, to chapter 4 of Micah, you actually find that um, shepherds are implicit in the text. <laughs> 
Um, how does that happen? Well, actually it's interesting, we have a lot of intertestamental writings, or Messianic writings, particularly from Qumran, I think they come from, um, which show us the thinking on these verses in Micah. Um, and they, in particular they notice, I think it's in verse 8 of Micah 4, there's a reference to something referred to as the Migdal Ida, or the Tower of Ida, which you might find in your, your Bibles, or the Tower of the Flock, which is its translation. Um, and that's got significance, because we, we know um, in the rabbinic writings that the Tower of the Flock is a significant marker for the sheep that live around Jerusalem, ones that are being raised for sacrifice in the temple. Um, and the Migdal Ida is actually the very location at which shepherds watch their flocks from. The Tower of the Flock is a, is a pile of raised stones, with, often with a kind of little covering over it, which you could light a fire on and you could sit up there and it was just slightly elevated around against the field so you could see further. Um, and you find them dotted all over the, um, the ancient um, kind of Levant area that includes Jerusalem and Israel and so on. Um, and, and some of them go back you know, a couple of thousand years when you find them. They've been there for still being used today. <laughs> um, but very specifically we find um, uh, that there's an expectation um, in, uh, in the kind of rabbinic writing that, that the best sheep for, um, for sacrifice at the temple are raised within the boundary of the Tower of the Flock. So there they are. Now here they are in Micah. <laughs> So from the Tower of the Flock, and it starts talking about the Dominion coming, and there's, we have um, kind of expositions, rabbinic expositions of that passage, saying this is a reference to the Messiah. So the me reference to the Messiah is first going to be proclaimed, according to Micah 4, from the Tower of the Flock. In other words, the, the shepherds who are watching their flock. <laughs> That's part of the prophetic context. They're the very first people to proclaim it, which is why Luke tells us when they found it all, like the angel said, they went around telling everyone. They become the very first witnesses, fulfilling the prophecy of Micah. <laughs> um, but there's more. <laughs> um, because of course we, we read that Mary when he was born she wraps him in swaddling bands, bands of cloth, and lays him in the manger because there's no room at the, uh, the guest place. Um, it's the, the phrase that's used which can just mean a large room which guests would stay at normally. So he's on the inside of the house still but he's, he's in a lower part of the house where the animals would normally be, but um, he's been laid in the, the feeding trough and she's wrapped him, presumably for cleanliness and everything else, tightly in swaddling bands and the shepherds turn up <laughs> and they've been told that they'll find him like this and it says they marvelled, does it say they marvelled? I'm not sure. But anyway, they, it, they get very excited. <laughs> um, and, and the reason is, although I've never been able to actually trace the source, but I've been told by reliable sources on several occasions, <laughs> um, that actually within those flocks that are being bred for the temple and when you had a particularly healthy looking young lamb born um, in the early stages where it's susceptible to breaking a bone they would wrap it in swaddling bands to protect it <laughs> and so and that makes sense to me and so um, and I'm sure there is a source it's just I've not I always like to try and trace these things back and find them myself <laughs> and if that is the case part of their excitement is because they understand the significance of him being wrapped in swaddling bands um, but either way, those, those, um, those shepherds become the first proclaimers, just as Micah predicted, that from the Tower of the Flock the witness would go out of the dominion coming, um, of the fact that God had done something, which the angels had come to announce. Um, he was doing something into history, <laughs> um, and they went out as witnesses to that event. So it, it feels a little bit rushed this morning, but I often take too long on these things anyway. <laughs> Um, and if you do want more information, I've done quite a bit um, on the Christmas events um, in, a, in a playlist on my, on my YouTube channel, so you can always look at those things there. Um, but for this morning, I just hopefully what I want folks to really get a feel of is, is the birth of Jesus Christ is both historical um, and it's theologically significant. And there's often more to it than we pick up with a modern superficial reading of the text. So, until next week, the last week of Advent, where we'll look at John's testimony that roots Jesus' existence back to eternity. Um, I will say goodbye um, from me and my dogs who have disappeared into the undergrowth somewhere. See if I can find them. Um, there's one over there, one over there, and uh, one way off. Luna! 
no, she's not going to come. Oh well. So all it, really, all it really leaves for me to say is wishing you a happy Christmas. Hope you start enjoying your, uh, your Christmas celebrations and pulling a few crackers of your own. And I'll see you next week. Bye then. Thank you.